Where are you in this moment? Perhaps you are sitting, or standing in a room, or driving your car outside. Now close your eyes, unless you are driving. In which case, imagine your eyes are closed. Now where are you? You are in the dark. But what is it that is in the dark? And where is it to be so dark? The answer is, you. Or to be more accurate, your consciousness is in the dark. Even if the sun is shining bright, birds chirp and cars swerve out of your direction, your mind is experiencing darkness. Does that make you separate from the world around you? And if you are not separate from the natural world and its natural processes, can you still have free will? Are we all just a collection of atoms which form cells, which in turn form tissues, then organs, and then entire animals? Is our life just a physical or chemical reaction, no more autonomous than the freezing of water or nuclear fusion of a star? Or do we have a soul, some way of choosing our path in life, a way to escape the fate which binds the other atomic structures of our universe? Today we will explore the concept of the past, the future, fate and free will. This is not a scientific or philosophical video. This is merely an opinion in a sea of opinions. Part 1. We are made of stars. Your body is made of the universe. Every minuscule building block of your body can be found on the periodic table of the elements, as can every other structure in the universe. As strong as the human mind is, the human body is no different from the sky above it or the world around it. Every piece of our body, when examined and magnified to its most basic structures, has no distinct atomic difference from the cosmos in which it inhabits. We do not experience the world, we are the world, experiencing itself. But what does it mean to experience? We all experience consciousness. This deeper understanding of our surroundings that provides awareness through our thoughts and feelings. There are different perspectives on consciousness, including philosophical, neuroscientific and even spiritual viewpoints. Some theories propose that consciousness arises from the interactions of neurons in the neural networks of the brain. This suggests that consciousness is no more than the interaction of atoms which create our body. But if that is the case, what would happen if those atoms were to be replaced with identical copies? Would we have the exact same consciousness? In ancient Greece, philosophers grappled with this concept, which they called the Ship of Theseus Paradox. Imagine there's a ship, let's call it the Ship of Theseus, that has been sailing the seas for centuries. As time passes, parts of the ship begin to wear out and are replaced with new ones. Eventually, every single piece of the ship has been replaced with a new part. If every element has been replaced with an identical copy, is it still the same ship? If each individual component has been swapped out, can we still call it the ship of Theseus? Now let's say that the process of replacing the parts on the ship of Theseus wasn't done over centuries, it was done over the course of a day. Within 24 hours, ancient shipbuilders replaced every single nut bolt, screw, sail and beam on that ship and threw them into a big pile. Then they took that pile and rebuilt the ship of Theseus with the parts they had taken out. Which one ship is the ship of Theseus? Is it the one made of new parts which were replaced that day or that week or over many years? Or is it the ship that was rebuilt from the original parts? And what if the process was done simultaneously? As the Greeks dismantled one ship, they rebuilt it side by side next to the other. At what point does either of these ship of Theseus's stop being the original and instead become a copy? You may believe that the answer is subjective or that there is no answer because it's just a thought experiment by ancient people who didn't know what to name their boat. But what if I told you that every atom in your body is being replaced over the course of your lifetime? Our bodies are not stagnant like the ship of Theseus. With every passing moment, the food we digest, the water we drink, the air we breathe, all of it is absorbed into our bodies. At what point does a breath of oxygen stop being a breath and become a part of us? The cells within our body are in constant motion. They divide and grow into new cells. The very neural networks that make up our brain are replacing the biological components with fresh structures, much in the same way as the ship of Theseus. Odds are, every single atom in your body has been replaced since you were born. Now you could say you were a different person in your past, that you aren't like that now. 
But it is literally true. In every moment, you are physically different from the moment before. But you have a story, a pathway from your birth that led you to this exact moment. Perhaps you can follow that path through your memories, giving you an idea of who you are, what you believe, what makes up your consciousness. Even though you may not have been made of the same pieces, it is the story of you that creates your consciousness. But you are made of atoms, just like everything else. If we were to somehow rebuild your entire body with identical atoms, much like we did with the ship of Theseus, your copy would still have your memories stored in its mind. This copy would have the same story, which led them to this exact point in time. Your replica would believe that they were you, just as you do. You could be that replica. On the other side of the universe, far out of sight from even our observation, scientists of unknown intelligence could have just invented the Earth. They popped our existence right into this moment, giving every one of our planet's eight billion residents the illusion of a non-existent past formed in the neural pathways of our brain. But we know the past to be true. We have experienced at least some of it, or at least we think we did. But is it possible that the past is just a myth? Part 2 The Story of Us I'll give you an example. There's a moment coming. It's not here yet. It's still on the way. It's in the future. It hasn't arrived. Here it comes. Here it is. Oh, shit, it's gone. <laughs> there is no past. Or is there a future? There is only this exact moment. It has been this exact moment forever, and it will always be this exact moment. This is the only moment there ever will be. It is an endless moment, seismically compressed between the past and future, always out of reach. When we study the past for historical purposes, we are studying this exact moment, just when this moment was some other time. And when we look to the future, again, we are only looking at this exact moment, when it occurs later. We always seem to marvel at the future, but our depictions of such a time are coated in the way we view this exact moment as it is now. Think of the futurism of the 1950s, when we believed one day cars would be powered by nuclear fission, or in the 1800s, when we believed we would one day domesticate whales as a means of transportation across the seas. Even those predictions which turned out to be accurate are still coated in the zeitgeist of the day in which they were predicted. The late 19th century painter Jean-Marc Coté imagined that one day we would be able to have face-to-face -face meetings with people across the world, but he believed this would be done through coal-powered projector screens. The rise of automation had futurists believe that robots would take over industry, but they imagined these robots as chrome-plated men who walked on two legs, wearing clothes and speaking English to the humans they served. It is easy to laugh at the silly predictions people have made for our present, just as people will one day look at our own predictions and laugh at what we think the future will hold. We cannot fathom what this moment will bring to us in the future, the ways in which it will come about, how it would look or feel to be in the future. Yet somehow we think we can do this with the past. Every year our perception on the past changes. There is an entire field of study known as historiography which studies the history of history. For example, the first notable historian was Herodotus, an ancient Greek who wrote plays on the recent Persian wars between Persia and Greece. He interviewed men who fought in the Battle of Marathon, Solaris and Thermopylae. In his histories he mentions that in Persia there were ants the size of dogs. He mentions that Greek victory was not just due to the content of their character, the might of their military, but it was the will of their gods. Today, when we study history, we know such a thing to be an impossibility. A historian will try to ascertain the true facts of what happens, while a historiographer will explain how the story of those events changed over time. They will note how the present moment paints the story of the past, coating it in its own sheen, just as it does with the future. To Herodotus, the things we believe were impossible were all true. Herodotus had a story, a recent story of things which the men he interviewed attested to. For centuries, that which was known as fact stayed that way, until the story changed by those distantly separated from it. We all have a story, we have a cause and effect series of events, which brought us here, to this moment, right now. 
But how can we be sure that the past which we have built our story around even existed at all? Could the past be a fiction? With each passing age and new discovery, the facts peeled away and replaced with new facts. Do we rebuild our history to match the present? Perhaps we only exist in this moment, and all moments before are a myth we created to explain how we got here. Alexander the Great could trace his family lineage back to Hercules. The Japanese emperor could trace his to Amaterasu, the celestial sun god. And the Egyptian pharaohs could do the same with his, keeping statues tracing back ancestry from such a primordial time before a written historical record. Their gods were not real. They were not real then as they are not real now. We know that these men's stories, the past they created for themselves, were lies. We know they lived a fiction, separate from what could possibly be true. And perhaps one day in the future, when future historians and look back on us, they will see that our story is no more real than the histories by Herodotus, that the ways in which we live our lives could never have happened. They will invent new stories to replace us. Even if our names are remembered, every piece of what we were will be stripped away. And one day when this moment lies in the future, you may look back on that collection of atoms that once formed your body and realize that person was just a fiction. It was a story you made up to explain why you are here, now, in this moment. But if our past is so uncertain, always in flux, could the same be said of our future? Do we have a destiny, or are we free to create our own fate? Part 3. Who are we? If I were to cut off all your toes, it would hurt. But you would still be you. If I were to remove a single atom from your brain, you would not even notice, nor would you cease to be yourself. But what if I removed two atoms, or three, or a thousand? Imagine every atom was systemically removed from your body one at a time. There would be no single moment where you fail to exist. Your consciousness might fade, but there would not be one time where you stopped being you. What if the atoms were removed by an advanced scientist with a very accurate machine? This scientist started to put those atoms back together to form your body somewhere else. Would your consciousness reform to tether itself and pilot your biological machine? This scientist may decide to rebuild this body far across the universe, on a distant planet, or just one inch to the left. It isn't like your consciousness is grounded to one single spot. Your current body is already in motion. It moves every day even when you are sick laying in bed. Every passing moment we rotate relative to the Earth, which spins around a star, which spirals away from the Big Bang. So, what would happen if your body was torn down atom by atom, instantly reformed one Planck unit away? Would it still be your consciousness inside that body? If you still believe your consciousness to be a reality and your own, then it would be formed at conception or birth, or at some time when you began to create memories, a story which you must believe to be real. On a scientific level, you know that the housing for your mind is your body. It is where your mind is stored. And it will be that way from the moment you first think your thoughts to the moment in which you die. But the universe is very big. It is even bigger than a jumbo jet airplane, which is like an aircraft, just bigger. Our sun is also very big. It is not as big as the universe, but the sun is much larger than the Earth. To imagine the size of the universe, we can imagine that our sun was not big. We can pretend, just for now, that the sun was the size of a grain of sand. Let's imagine that every star, no matter its current size, was also represented by one other grain of sand. What would happen if we took all those tiny sand-sized suns and put them all into a big pile? How much sand would we have? Our pile of sand-sized stars would be greater than the Sahara Desert. It would be greater than every beach across the world combined. In fact, for every grain of sand currently on the Earth, from each grain in the depths of the ocean to those produced by industrial factories which make artificial sand, we would have 10,000 suns. There are an estimated 70 septillion stars. That is, a one followed by 23 zeros. The mass of the observable universe has a weight represented by 3 times 10 to the power of 55 grams. This means that there are an estimated 10 to the power of 80 atoms in the observable universe. That is a one followed by 80 zeros. Who is to say that in the future, after you have died, 
the atoms which formed your earliest consciousness, or identical copies of those same atoms, would not reform in the same pattern of structure. Whether this would occur artificially on Earth, or by natural processes somewhere else out in the vast universe, the tiny spark, the beginning of your mind, your story, could be pieced together again. And if that is the case, how would your story differ? In this life, we may be bound to some sort of fate, a pattern by which our bodies are forced to move through our lives through the chemical and physical processes both internal and external. But if we were to reform what makes you, under different circumstances, with different external forces acting upon you, then this fate would have to change. Perhaps we are destined to follow a single path. But when the time comes for us to exist elsewhere, in some other time we would follow a different path. And it is impossible to say what the future may hold. In a way, even if fate does exist, we have many fates. We have innumerable destinies ahead of us. Even if we start anew without the memories of our previous lives, the atoms which form your consciousness could be formed again, and they could be formed with a new fate. We are not bound by a single destiny. The sheer magnitude of our universe and the innumerable years of the future mean that we are free to live our life in whichever way we please. The past will always be a mystery and the future undetermined.